welcome to episode 11 of On Liberty, coming to you for, live from the Center for Independent Studies in Sydney, Australia. I'm your host, Salvatore Babonis, and joining me today is journalist Lindsay Shepard. Lindsay has been covering anti-lockdown protests as an investigative journalism fellow with True North Center in Canada. We'll be talking today about lockdowns and liberty. Lindsay Shepard, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for being on this show. Look, governments of all persuasions have embraced newfound powers <laughs> with alacrity. They seem to love it. Were you surprised? Was I surprised? Yeah. Not really. I mean, I was surprised at the ridiculous of some of the things that are happening. Um, I mean, here in Canada, we've had by bylaw officers for going rollerblading in an empty parking lot with their family <laughs> and allegedly this you know violates social distancing and all that um yet our government officials here they've gone kayaking they're going to their cottages um uh -huh. Trudeau was just at a, a protest, so. <laughs> uh, well, really not surprising at all, I guess. Look, we know there have been sweeping government actions to try to prevent coronavirus, not just in Australia. Australia has been pretty light. We know that, like, the UK has had these massive lockdowns and big controversy. Look, isn't this just necessary for public health? I mean, Mr. Mill himself says that you can do things in order to uh protect others i mean isn't that something that governments were justified in doing i think what it comes down to is people have noticed how much of this is so arbitrary so for example usually when i go grocery shopping um i use a reusable bag because i don't want to add right. more plastic bags to the landfill um, and a lot of the grocery stores have banned the use of reusable bags supposedly right. because the uh, fabric that's been in your house is going to transmit microbes into their grocery store could transmit the virus, right? Um, right? But yet at the same time, I'm allowed to touch everything in the store. I could probably, you know, rest my elbow near the cashier or my purse and they wouldn't say anything about it. So it's just the absolute arbitrariness of it all. We've got a lot of arbitration in Australia, people being uh, fined for sitting on park benches. But I'm talking about the, the bigger issue of, you know, can government just step in and say, sorry, everyone, you have to stay home. Sorry, business you have to close, and maybe without even saying sorry, because they, honestly, they don't even seem very sorry about it. It almost seems like they're reveling in the ability to shut down businesses and keep people home. Yeah, so I did see some research that said um, attendance and like patronage of businesses was already tapering off before the government's mandated shutdowns. But that being said, I'm more on the side of the businesses probably should have been able to choose what they wanted to do. Because personally for me, I was willing to go to any business throughout this whole thing. And there actually was in my province, like, you know, the, the cafe uh, down the street from me, they stayed open just with no seating. And so I, I understand that that's quite lenient as compared to some other places. But I was someone who was completely willing to support these small businesses. And right. uh, it should have been their choice from the get go, I think. Well, but that's a big question. I, I, I mean, so I, I don't want to just kind of take the rah-rah liberty approach. I know a lot of our viewers would take that, but you know, there are legitimate public health concerns sometimes. And without getting into the, the epidemiology, I mean, there are real questions as to whether these closures and lockdowns were necessary, but leaving those big questions aside, even if they are necessary for public health, is it something the government should be able to do? I, I mean, what, what's your take on the moral side of that? Is, is this a power we want governments to have? Well, I saw a sign uh, at one of the anti-lockdown protests I attended, and his sign said something like, um, you know, quarantining healthy people is tyranny. I think it said something like that. So I think his argument was, well, fine, if you're like someone who's immunocompromised and you want to take these measures for yourself, then like, please do stay home. But for all of us, can we keep things going for ourselves? Right, right. I mean, and you said you've been covering lockdown protests. What? I mean, I haven't actually been to any of these protests. So I'm not sure uh, if they've really been present in Australia because our luck that lockdown has been so light touch in a way. Uh, terrible for businesses in Australia, but you know, relatively light for those of us being locked down. But I know in other countries it's been pretty severe. I mean, what what's been happening at the protests? What are people angry about? How how many people are turning out? 
Yeah, so in the smaller cities across Canada, I think these protests are very, very small, um, probably a dozen or less people. In the big cities like Toronto, you're seeing a decent turnout. Uh, and the Vancouver area one is which I attended one of those. Um, what was it the day that I went? It was in uh, late April. I think it was about 100. Um, right. However, it, it was around that time that those protests peaked. So they actually kind of peaked in early May. They are now very much tapered off. And um, I did know people who kept attending the protests and they said that these protests did devolve into being basically only about anti-vaccination. And so it's oh, really? the one I attended, it was very much about, um, you know, what are, what are the secondary effects of these lockdowns? So economic effects, mental health, increased rates of alcoholism, suicide, domestic abuse, all that was kind of at the top of mind from the people that I spoke to. Right. Um, but it did devolve kind of into, you know, anti-vax, 5G, Bill Gates. Um, <laughs> and, and interest, I think, has really just tapered off um, because I, I don't think people want to be involved with that if they have serious concerns about the economy and mental health yeah well of course you know any protest attracts people who want have something to protest about i mean i i know here in australia whenever i see a protest say about you know uh, uh well for example the climate catastrophism protests also had indigenous rights activists uh pro bashir al-assad <laughs> <laughs> protesters, um, you know, every kind of person under the sun, unionists, you know, anyone, if there's a protest going on, we can join it. So I guess it's not surprising that a anti-lockdown protest would also attract support from all sorts of groups who just want to be part of a protest. It's not necessarily a bad thing. I, I mean, if, you know, they want to join, they want to join, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I just think it's too bad that people who are kind of just scared of being associated with that. They back oh, off. Okay. And then the protest kind of becomes all about, like, for example, anti-vax. Um, and the people who were kind of concerned about um, mental health, economic effects, they will no longer touch those protests, no longer voice their oh. opinion about anything because they're so afraid of being labeled a conspiracy theorist or an anti-vaxxer or something like that. So, right. yeah. And to be clear to everyone listening, anti-vaxxers or anti-vaccine activists who are afraid that vaccines are connected to autism or other uh, childhood illnesses. Um, uh, Lindsay, but did you see any police involvement in these protests? I mean, were these protests dispersed or were they allowed to go ahead? Uh, were they given permits or denied permits? I mean, what, how did the government react to these protests? Um, so in Vancouver, they are a weekly affair. So and police was present um, when I was kind of marching alongside these protesters, I heard a lot of heckling. Um, and, you know, it was probably 80% uh, negative. So, you know, go home, stay home, boo, and 20% positive, you know, thumbs up. Um, but as for the government response, I know the Toronto anti-lockdown protest, um, the premier of that province, Ontario, he called those people a bunch of yahoos. So okay. he was, you know, like insulting them. Right. Um, but then when it comes to the recent, you know, anti-black racism and Black Lives Matter protests, um, all of a sudden the gears kind of switch and he's saying, you know, thanks for thanks for protesting in groups of thousands. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's something I wanted to get to, this contrast between, you know, how politicians have reacted to one or the other kind of protest during, you know, during this virus emergency. Uh, clearly, this seems to be about ultimately comes down to, to power and power, although people involved in Black Lives Matter's protests might be chagrined to hear them being referred to as having power on their side, when you have endorsements from political leaders that is having power on your side. And, you know, certainly the technology companies, the corporate, uh, the corporate world has come out on behalf of that versus technology companies have tried to suppress any kind of, um, uh, anti-lockdown message, right? So how is power interacting with people's ability to just express their opinion when it comes to uh, how they handle the coronavirus, what they do personally with regards to the coronavirus? Well, I know the Black Lives Matter protesters, they're arguing that um, this is a public health problem, you know, like white supremacy is a public health problem. And if, if that's your argument, okay, fine. But wasn't um, 
mental health during lockdowns also a very valid public health concern and that was pretty much laughed off by everyone right. and not taken seriously um i mean yeah and, and people in canada are, are talking about trudeau who recently was making headlines because he took a knee at uh, one of these anti-black racism rallies and I, I mean he was in a crowd of thousands while doing this of course like surrounded by his security team but still it's, it's a crowd of thousands yet um parliament is not in session because that was deemed right. too dangerous so uh it, it's just it doesn't make any sense and it just goes back to the beginning right it's also so arbitrary well that's what i'd like to, i'd like to focus on arbitrariness so i'm really interested i'm going to use that word again power so i'm interested in this question of you know, should government be trying to disparage some political expression while endorsing other forms of political expression. I mean, isn't government supposed to be the outcome of our political expression, not trying to shape it? Yeah, I, I think, though, they don't want to speak out against, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter protesters because it, they would look bad, frankly. Right. Right? <laughs> so um, I, I don't know. I don't even expect consistency at this point. But it's important to call it out. Some some people still notice it. So, right. Speaking of call outs, I, I'd like to call out just a, a thank you to uh, people who are out there watching today, including Johnny. Thanks, Julie. Great to have you here. Philip, appreciate you watching. So, thanks everyone for being online. We're going to go to questions in just about five minutes. But for now, I have some more questions for Lindsay. I want to ask you, what do you think is the proper role for government in managing? public health. Has government overstepped its bounds with this crisis? I mean, again, I, I know you're not an epidemiologist. I'm not asking you what should have been done from a medical perspective. I'm asking you from a political perspective. Is government just taking too much or has the response, have the responses been, you know, in line with government responsibilities? Um, yes, they've overstepped. And uh, one example, and the thing is, they're kind of, you know, um, dictating everything to public health officials and I guess you can kind of hide behind that in a way. But uh, here in my province, they, you know, so drive in theaters. So where you, you know, drive your car and you watch a movie on the big screen in the outdoors, the open fresh air, they're telling us to seek fresh air, right? Because there's less transmission of the virus. Um, so, you know, drive in cinemas, some newspapers were saying they're making a comeback. Like there's so much nostalgia, like we're enjoying this activity again because we can't go to the cinema. Um, so just as we're seeing this kind of comeback and, and renewed interest in uh, outdoor cinemas, the province says, okay, actually, you can only have 50 cars and the cars <laughs> must be two meters apart, even though, like, cars have to socially distance now, you know? Um, and, you know, there was outrage from some of the, the outdoor cinema owners saying this doesn't make any sense, uh, especially when this is happening months after. So when we're allegedly entering like a reopening phase, this is now introduced, even though they were open the whole time at a larger capacity before. Right, right. Look, uh, we're going to go to viewer questions in just a minute. And so if you are, well, not if you are, I know you're watching there at home. So please do get your questions in. The easiest way for me to get them is via YouTube. So if you go to the YouTube comment section, just type in your question. We'll be able to feed that through Lindsay. And we do have a little time delay. So if you go ahead and get the questions in now, I'll be able to ask them when we go to questions in about two minutes. So please do get those questions in. Of course, we'd also welcome your support. If you want to go to cis.org.au or click that support button, there's a support link in the YouTube comments. I want to remind everyone that CIS accepts no public funding of any kind or no uh, government funding of any kind. And that includes the job keeper benefits. So CIS has been pushing through this crisis without job keeper support. It's been tough for people, not for me. I work at the University of Sydney. I have a salary, but the producers in the show, the staff at CIS, they all rely on your support. So please click the support link. Uh, we really could use it for end of financial year. Lindsay, I don't want to you know, press too hard. I don't want to be kind of like a, you know, a, a tough, tough interviewer, but I really want to push you on the government side because we've been talking a lot about how, you know, what's appropriate, what's kind of ridiculous about what governments are doing. But fundamentally, what should government be allowed to do? I, I mean, some things would protect us that, that 
you know, we, you know, we know we protect, protect us and make, make us safer, safer but government, government just, just is allowed, allowed into those, those spheres of our, our lives. Uh, you, uh, you, we, don't we don't have video cameras, video cameras in all of our, our bedrooms to make sure, sure we, don't we don't harm ourselves, ourselves right? right? Because, because it's, it's not a sphere, sphere for government, government to, get to get involved. involved. Has, has government overstepped, overstepped or has, has it not overstepped, overstepped in, in Canada, Canada or, or in other, other countries, if you have other countries' examples, with regard to taking action about coronavirus? Yeah. yeah, so in Canada, I would absolutely say they overstepped. Like I said about the businesses uh, earlier, um, businesses should have stayed open at their own risk. Uh, people should have been able to do whatever activities they wanted at their own risk. Um, you know, I realized that because I wanted to take my son to the playground, but they had the yellow caution tape on it. <laughs> yes, we did and here, um, I, I thought to myself, like, I am totally fine using this playground, letting my son use this playground. Um, the only thing I'm worried about when I think about it is someone seeing from the window of their house that I'm here and snitching on me. Like, that's what I was scared of, people snitching, right. you know, to government officials about me. And that's what was keeping me away from it. I ended up still sometimes, you know, going through the caution tape and letting my son play. Um, but, yeah, it's a scary thing to be afraid that your neighbor is going to snitch on you to the government. And And when I talk about the government overstepping, I think... The reaction, the full reaction from people has been quelled because in Canada, um, we had something called the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, which right. was a payout of uh, $2,000 to everyone who's lost work. And I think uh, if people weren't paid off, there would have been a lot more anger. And that is kind of how I see it. I see it as people having been paid off. Right, right. Uh, uh, you, so, so you actually, actually were... were uh, forgive, forgive me. I don't want to get, get you in trouble. trouble. Violating uh, the uh, lockdown rules with your son. Um, did you get any trouble for that? I mean, did police stop by and say you were a bad, bad mom? mom? I, I mean, did anything, anything happen? happen? No, 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 no nothing, nothing happened. happened. I, I, I think, I think like, like the one, one time, time I was on one playground, playground someone, someone walked by and, and just smiled at me. So they probably, so they probably didn't, didn't care either. either. Um, it, it looks like now the caution tape is down. So I don't know what the difference was between last week and today. Um, yeah. And now, it, yeah, I mean, yeah, even tennis courts were closed, like everything, right? Right. Now we have Eric uh, here online from the Netherlands. Uh, so we do have a global viewership here. And Eric is saying he was surprised by, by the, the contrast, contrast between, between you know, how, how people, people in, in the Netherlands, Netherlands uh, really, really were, were cautious. cautious. I mean, I mean, there, was, there, was there was a lot of condemnation of Black, Black Lives Matter protests, protests in the Netherlands on public, public health grounds. grounds. But, but he's surprised that in the Anglosphere, there's, there's been a complete reluctance, reluctance to say anything about that. that. Do you think do that, that has to do with... with well, well, do, do you have, have any idea, idea with, with this? I mean, why, why should we in the Anglo-Saxon Anglo countries or uh, uh, English-speaking countries be so much, much more, more sensitive, sensitive about this issue, issue than, than, say, continental Europeans? Europeans? Um, well, we have a lot of discourse, uh, as is clear from news coverage right now, about, you know, white supremacy um, being a danger, far-right extremism being a danger. I don't know how present that would be in, like, the Netherlands. Um, so that's, and so when, you know, the protesters say this is a public health issue, you know, like far-right extremism, um, well, it kind of gives them a cover, right? Right. Now, unfortunately, I, I just want to tell everyone listening, I, 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 unfortunately, I'm, I'm not, not actually signed, signed in today, today to prompt, prompt for questions, questions on the chat, chat window. window. So usually, usually, I know I'm there saying, saying interacting, interacting with people saying, saying want to clarify questions. questions. I, know I know you're hearing, hearing me. me. If you are hearing me, please do put the questions in the chat window. We're getting lots of comments in the chat window, uh, not any questions right now. So we do want to hear what you guys want us to talk about. Uh, I will take the moment to give the plug uh, for membership. We'd like to have you as a member of CIS. Click that support button, you become a member. Click the like button on YouTube. And of course, please subscribe to the channel so you get notifications for the shows. Uh, Lindsay, what do you think Canada should have done? I mean, we've had you know a lot of criticism of things they did do, and I think we can ridicule things, but you know, from where you're sitting, what should have been done differently? I think it should have been up to each department, business, individual to assess their own personal risk. And I, I totally get people taking it seriously at the beginning. I would say for me, since, you know, the pandemic was announced March, you know, 11th, I think it was, uh, probably for about maybe 24 hours, I actually was maybe thinking, okay, this is serious. Like there's going to be like, oh, it's going to be like the movie Contagion and all this. 
Um, but still, like to this day, I have not worn a mask once. Um, right. You know, and and so when I see you know municipalities saying you're going to have to wear a mask on the bus, it's like, mm, well, if, if I mean, if someone's on the bus, like. I don't, I don't know if they're right, really right. the type who, who's going to be all, you know, Lysol and and masks and all that. So, <laughs> right, right. We have a comment from Anthony, uh, or oh, sorry, a comment from Philip. Uh, that government, quote unquote, is not a single thing. Of course, there are you know, many different people in government with many different interests. And something I've written about and been interested in is that health officials have a different agenda from other people in government. And I think in Australia, there's been too much of a readiness to simply listen to whatever a health official says and not put any, uh, not put, give any consideration to what other government advisors or other levels of government might want. Um, do you have thoughts on government being multifaceted and should we, you know, are we listening too much to one group in government? I mean, they always say in wartime, they listen too much to generals during the war and not enough to generals during peacetime. Is it the same with listening too much to health officials at pandemic time and, you know, maybe not enough when we don't have a pandemic? Um, well, so public health officials are being treated like heroes here. And right. OK, fine. But I mean, uh, Dr. Teresa Tam, who's our you know chief public health officer, right. for example, she uh, in regards to the anti-black racism rallies, she said, OK, you can go attend the protests, but just don't shout, because if you shout, <laughs> your, your droplets <laughs> increase. And, and like, you, you were kind of prompting me on the question of, of overstepping in power, but I think when you pick up on these things and you can ridicule them, that's actually very subversive in a way, and it is a way of questioning their power, because you're kind of saying, like, really, you're saying this to me, to me that, that I, I can't, can't shout at a protest, protest because, because of, uh, of the droplets, droplets you, know? you know? And, and I, think I think it's kind of, kind of little, little things, things like that, that that can make people start, start to question the power of government, what they're being told by officials. Right, right. Um, we have a, a question from Anthony. Now, now it is a provocative a one, <laughs> so be ready. Anthony asks, you know, has civilized society now been defeated? And uh, his word, not mine, uh, will the appeasement of what has been called the woke Taliban, he puts that in scare quotes, make things worse in the long run? Um, so I guess, is this kind of about like the riots that have been happening? Well, yeah. I think he, he seems to think, yes. Yeah. Is this the end of civilization? Or I think he's saying that tongue in cheek a little bit. But is, you know, is this a, a permanent change, you think, in how society is going to operate? Um, I think it's yet to be seen. A lot of people are saying that because a lockdown preceded the riots, they were like extra rioty because they were cooped up before. Um, but I don't, I don't think so. I think, mm. you know, that sentiment was always there. I don't think the, the lockdowns really played a role in any kind of pent up energy. I think that was already there. Um, but at the same time, so is this like the end of civilization or civilized society? Um, I, Honestly, when I see the the clips of the the break-ins and stuff going on, and then simultaneously, you, simultaneously you're being told that um, the protests are largely peaceful, it's right. really hard to know what's going on. Um, in Canada, we've in Canada we just copy the U.S. Right, so they had some. No, I, didn't, I didn't say that. You <laughs> said that. <laughs> yeah, so they they have protests over there. there. Okay, we're gonna do ours too. Um, I know the Vancouver one was. I think 100% peaceful, aside from like the weird arrest of one YouTuber, which was kind of strange, uh, I guess, for provoking a crowd or something they justified it as. Um, but it, it's really hard to know what to believe when you're when you're seeing break ins and looting, but you're being told it's 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 peaceful most of the time. Well, let me let me pull this back, back towards coronavirus. So this also has clear implications for Black Lives Matter. Um, what about social media companies deciding that they're going to police speech on their platforms? Now, of course, they have a responsibility to police criminal speech. They can't allow child pornographers to be on social media platforms. But when they start saying we're going to not allow YouTube videos that advocate this or that public health response, we're not going to allow tweets that take this or another approach, you're putting content warnings on people who criticize the World Health Organization. Um, is, is this eroding uh, our ability to communicate? 
Yeah. So, I mean, I heard there was a controversy with, there was a film called Plandemic that was removed from YouTube. Okay. I, I don't, I didn't see it. Um, there, I saw a bit of uproar about this right. being removed. Um, and of course, because you hear about it being removed, it makes you want to seek it out. So I, I probably will end up trying to find that at some point. Um, but yeah, like I, I think it was like I was listening to the Joe Rogan podcast. He was saying that, you know, they don't like YouTube doesn't remove flat earth stuff because it's just so out there that they don't even care if it's on their platform. But they will remove COVID-19 related stuff. Why is that? Do they see some sort of validity in, in what's being said? And that's why they're being prompted to remove it. Right. Well, I mean, they're they're saying that they're doing it for public health reasons. But uh, one thing that you know, YouTube, for example, was consistently pushing people towards the World Health Organization and its official advice. Meanwhile, people like me have been thoroughly criticizing the World Health Organization for being politically captured by China. So, you know, how do we reconcile this? I mean, are 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 the executives at YouTube and Twitter and Facebook really the right people to be deciding what's appropriate speech and what isn't? No, no, no. And, and I'd like to pick up on what you just said about the World Health Organization being mm -hmm. politically captured by China. Is that what you said? Right, right. Um, so right now, our Conservative Party in Canada, they're undergoing a leadership race. And one of the candidates said exactly what you just said. <laughs> and there are now calls for him to be kicked out of the party. And kicked are you out serious? Of, yeah, kicked out as a leadership candidate because uh, uh, our chief public health officer is... Um, is Chinese or from, from Hong Kong in origin. And so people are saying this was a racist thing to say because our chief officer is from Hong Kong. Obviously you meant that she, like, she's not loyal to Canada, she's loyal to China. And he's just like, no, that's not what I meant. I right. meant like the, the WHO was covering up stuff for China and, and kind of towing their line throughout the pandemic. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's become this whole thing now uh, with this unfortunate thing that happened to this guy. Right. I, I mean, I want to get at this nexus, though, between, between technology companies and government, because, of course, as an American, you know, I cherish that in the United States we have this absolute constitutional protection. Congress will make no law that abridges the freedom of speech. But, of course, Google and Facebook can make laws like that. And here in Australia, the government definitely can make laws that abridge freedom of speech, I assume in Canada as well. Um, to what extent are our basic freedoms likely to be eroded by, you know, these successful, and I put successful in scare quotes, successful interventions that social media companies made in quashing free speech when it comes to coronavirus? Yeah, yeah so, so I'm, I'm very worried about, um, you know, power being handed over them, to, over to the social media companies, because right. we know they've, they've done things like kick off, you know, gender critical feminists for being okay. transphobic on, on social media. And so they get to define these things. And and I've been like permanently banned from Twitter before. Um, oh, really? Lot, yeah, a perma ban. But because I had enough, um, you know, like verified Twitter users speaking up about it, they reinstated me. Um, others haven't been so lucky. Um, but it just shows how they, they'll kick you off and you try to get in contact with them and, and they're just not there. I guess they're just so overwhelmed with how many people are on their platform. They can't get back to you. But there's no there's no recourse. No, um, I, I don't want to ask you like, to tell us anything personal you don't, you don't want, want to tell. But you've probably told this story in the media before and I've missed it. Do you want to tell us how you got kicked off Twitter? Yeah, so it was last summer. Um, it's, it last, turns last winter. Last winter for us. Oh, OK, OK. <laughs> last uh, July. Um, so there was this, this trans activist, um, named Yaniv. I don't know if this made the news down there, but, um, Yaniv wanted female estheticians to wax Yaniv's, um, male genitalia. Ah, uh, yes. That was in the news ever in the world. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and so, so uh, Yaniv and I were taking shots at each other on Twitter, but only I was, uh, kicked off at that point but luckily i, I made it back because i think yaniv has no one in their corner so right. uh it, it's not like anyone was on their side right anthony has a really, really interesting good. observation here and i hadn't thought of the term before so i'm going to thank you anthony i'm going to steal this for my next article are we witnessing the privatization of censorship 
Does that term resonate for you? Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. That's a really good way to put it. Um, right. Because, you know, some people will argue like, oh, censorship is only when the government or the state does it to you. Well, that ignores a lot of other facets where you can be censored and where censorship right. can happen. Well, on the other hand, uh, Twitter, Twitter, YouTube, YouTube Facebook, these are primarily you know organizations that sell commercial advertising they want to make sure that their sites are friendly for commercial advertising i mean couldn't we take a civil libertarian approach to say that you know really they're private companies they can do what they want with their platforms and it's it's their business we shouldn't really be concerned about it yeah you know whenever, whenever this issue comes up i always just have to say you know i'm i'm we're in the thick of it um, I mean, how long have we really been talking about this issue? Uh, it's, it's, and it's hard to, to come to a conclusion right now. I mean, I, I did my degree in communication, my undergraduate degree, right. and there were these kind of, so we talked about, you know, media, society, technology. Uh, I don't remember ever talking about censorship. <laughs> it's probably not part of their, you know, leftist agenda, but, um, you know, there, but, my point is like throughout the program, which was centered on media, technology and society, there were some perpetual questions that there was never really an answer for. Right. Um, and I think this is where we're at with this question of, you know, as uh, was it Anthony said, the privatization yeah. of censorship. Yeah, I think that's where we're at. Like, I don't know if there's any clear answer yet. Right. But I mean, could we see this as a matter of corporate rights? I mean, I mean in a way, doesn't, you know, doesn't Google have a right to its own free speech uh, and it can decide what it wants to say or allow us to say via it? I mean, if I think of it as a newspaper, if I send an article to a newspaper and they don't agree with it, they don't publish it. So can't YouTube do the same? I think the, I think the scale, scale is so different, you know, like that's why everyone speaks of social media as being so revolutionary. It's because suddenly the like for the most part, the gatekeepers are gone. And of course, now we're talking about the gatekeepers actually being here. But for the most part, they were removed. It, you know, it was very different than, you know, the one way stream of a right. newspaper. Right. Um, now, yeah, go on. Well, and now, you know, we're kind of seeing that at risk. What right. we now, value so much about it. Now, Tony's watching on Facebook and he wants to push, push back, back towards coronavirus. <laughs> He's asking, mm -hmm. you know, if you're not wearing personal protective equipment, by which I guess he means masks, that's, you know, you're, couldn't that be called a freedom to spread the virus? I mean, do people really have a freedom like that? Isn't, isn't a person spreading a virus infringing as, you know, our good old friend John Stewart would say, infringing on the rights of others to enjoy their own lives? So I would definitely not go out if I was, you know, feeling any symptoms. And now we're we're seeing a report that asymptomatic people actually don't spread the virus. I don't know if it was at all or if just not easily or um, much less than we thought. Um, so I think like if you are very, very concerned about this virus and you're kind of letting the fear overtake you, then, um, you know, you're definitely welcome to stay at home and, and get people to bring stuff for you, all that. For me, um, I see health holistically. I want to be walking outside. I want to let my son play. Uh, you know, that's for physical and mental health. And um, I think that that holistic view is more important than, um, you know, walking within two meters of someone maybe at a grocery store or whatever. Right. And that's a good issue to bring up. Is it my responsibility to protect your health? Or is it your responsibility to protect your health? I mean, we've, we've seen this with childhood vaccination for measles, but that's different because children are going, you know, if they want to go to school, they have to be vaccinated. But that's not, the, you know, that's not quite the same situation. Since we can say, well, practically speaking, children have to go to school. If you have to homeschool, it's a huge burden. I, I mean, childhood vaccines are one thing. With the coronavirus and with, the, with, these, with adult illnesses like this, can't we expect adults to take responsibility for their own health? That is, if if they're the ones who are afraid of catching it, they should stay home. Yeah, and I mean, I, I understand, like, there are people who are immunocompromised and everything, and I'm, I'm not, like, 
say I'm not making any kind of argument about like oh let the weak die or whatever like definitely not it's I see it as two way like right. I'll do my part but like I don't I also don't think you should suppress people when again like health is holistic why why hyper focus on this little thing and a lot of people have brought up why do we we spend so much time analyzing these coronavirus rates of death uh and no one cared to do that with say fentanyl um you know so why why just hyper focus on this and not looking at the bigger picture right right, right. right. I, I mean we're going to wrap up in about five minutes so get your final questions in we do have uh a, 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 well eric characteristically, as I do know, Eric, is uh, bringing up, he didn't say it in his question, but he's bringing up both John Stuart Mill uh, and Alexis de Tocqueville. So we're going to get quite intellectual here. Uh, both of those authors expressed a concern that specifically in America, but also more broadly, that the most effective form of citizenship, of, of censorship, the most effective form of censorship, especially in English speaking countries, and especially in the United States, uh, was the censorship of public opinion. And Lindsay, you talked about that a little bit when you said you were worried about your neighbors you know, looking through their curtains when you brought your son to the playground. Um, is it possible that the censorship of public opinion is actually more worrying? I mean, for John Stuart Mill, a lot of people don't realize this. He wasn't just for limiting the power of government. He wanted to limit the power of public opinion to influence people's behaviors. Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville made the same argument in Democracy in America. He said, oh, the problem isn't government censorship. The problem is that the, the public, public will censor, censor you. Is, is this, this really, really like, like characteristic, characteristic of our, our Anglosphere society? societies? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, anyone who, you know, throughout like, let's say uh, the month of April, you know, was the height of it in late March. Anyone who questioned the lockdowns, you were like eviscerated online. So when I wrote that I had gone to a protest and written this article about it, right. uh, about my experience there, I had all this barrage of comments telling me I had now joined the far right. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, since when did, you know, questioning uh, a government lockdown and what other health effects it might have become far right? And of course, that's that's kind of slur is a way of like, hey, get in line, like, hey, conform. Right. Um, why are you not obeying the government? And it's right. like, I, and I mean, it's not even factually correct. Like, aren't us uh, like anti-vaxxers more likely to be like environmentalist, like leftist Californian women? Like, isn't right. that, you know? Uh, so I don't know when this became far right. And it's, of course, it's just a way to say, you know, you got to get in line. Like, we're, we're all doing this and obeying. You have to obey too. <laughs> Right. But I mean, Chris brought up the uh, HBO pulling Gone with the Wind from its site, and they say that they're going to reinstate it uh, with essentially a set of trigger warnings, <laughs> you know, a bunch of warnings about context. Now, I think any reasonable person knows that Gone with the Wind was made in an era when uh, America was segregated and when the Civil War was still almost a living, was just about a living memory. Um, we're seeing, though, companies, you know, you know take these, well, deny us the ability to watch a movie. Now, that's not a huge uh, imposition on my life, but, you know, for instance, for instance, I love the original Showboat, which is a very anti-racist movie starring Paul Robeson, of all people, who was, a, you know, one of the great civil rights leaders of 20th century America, and yet Showboat is not shown on American TV and can't be seen anywhere because Paul Robeson, the black human rights activist, uses the N-word uh, in it, and that's taboo, and so we can't see Showboat. Um, on the other hand, I don't own these movies. You know, the movie companies own the movies. Is it, uh, I, I mean, is it right? Is it legal? Is it appropriate that they should be able to stop me from, you know, being able to see some of the greatest works of art of the 20th century? My instinct is to say, say that, that it's wrong, and but also that there's, bigger implications to that kind of thing. So this is this thing with Gone with the Wind happened amongst like heightened racial sensitivities right now. And but more serious things are, are happening. I mean, um, in Canada, we had a, a guy who was kicked off. He was a former member of parliament, Stockwell Day, and he was kicked off of two of his board positions and kicked off of his pundit spot on our national broadcaster because he said 
he doesn't believe that we have systemic racism in Canada. And he, like he was voicing an opinion that if you talk to the average person, that's probably they will voice the exact same thing. OK, now they see that someone says this on TV, what they privately think. Oh, that got them fired from two jobs or board positions. And now they can never appear on TV ever again. Uh, yeah, I'm definitely not going to ever voice my opinion on that subject. And it 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 means you don't talk openly about it anymore because you're so afraid of being canceled. And that's just one example. So amongst these, you know, heightened racial sensitivities, um, a lot of people are, are facing heat right now. Right. Johnny, by the way, I want to congratulate you on your Harry Weldon Award. Would you like to tell us about that? I'm not familiar with the Harry Weldon oh, that's, Award. Um, that was in 2018. Yeah. Yeah. A Canadian Values Award that I won in Ottawa. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, congratulations. Do you, to, do you want to tell us what you won it for? I'm sure people would love to hear about it. Uh, well, we'd have to go into the whole Jordan Peterson, Peterson video. Oh, uh, that's a second. Story. That's another <laughs> interview. Back. That's another interview. All right, so we're, we're going, going to take, to take just a, a final question, then we're going to wrap up. So I'm kind of giving everyone the warning that we're about to, to uh, wrap up the show. Of course, we would love to have people like the video, subscribe to the show, uh, contribute to CIS, you know, click on that support link. It's end of financial year. It's, of course, the most important time for us to, uh, to get support. What I'd like to know, Lindsay, is what do you think about the broad differences between free government in a place like Canada uh, and maybe the less free approach to government in, well, for my view, say continental Europe uh, versus, I mean, I think we can all agree that we don't want the kind of repression we see in China, but where do you pitch, you know, how much freedom is the right amount of freedom? Is Canada there? Do you envy American freedoms? Do you you know, re re recoil in horror and American violence. You know, you know, where where do you see the right balance between a free society and maybe a safe society? So, so yeah, yeah I, I do recoil in horror, as you say, like with American violence. But in some ways, I do. I envy the American spirit that we do not have in Canada, and it's a spirit <laughs> of, um, you know, I don't know what you would call it, even patriotism. Like, I feel like in America there would be. Um, Actually, a poll did show this, that Canadians were more likely to snitch on their neighbor throughout coronavirus. So, you know, less less um, allyship with each other here. Um, so that's, I kind of envy the American spirit, I would say. Oh, oh well, as, as American, I'm going to thank you from all 350 million of us. Thank you, Lindsay. And thanks, <laughs> thanks everyone for watching. Thank you very much, Lindsay Shepard, for taking the time to appear on On Liberty. Much appreciated. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, thanks everyone for watching. I would especially like to thank our producer, Emily Holmes, who's been struggling with all the technical problems people have been reporting. Thank you, Emily, for locking those down for us. Thanks executive producer, Max Hawk Weaver, for keeping us on the air. And thank you, Tom Switzer, director of the Center for Independent Studies for getting this all rolling in the first place. We will see you next week. Take care, everyone.